Everything we're saying is going out over here, so watch out. Just like I too early or something. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and that's after the motion is set. Yeah, because when you motion is set, we're going to be a quick discussion. Okay. And we have to, I'm assuming we have to give the reason why we want to. That's only if we're going to abstain because we have a bit of interest in that, okay? Why? Perfect. <laughs> the one, one of the ones that we're talking about is the so right I did. that's basically as soon as this motion is second I would come back so Good things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, One and I two, or an I one, not I two. Good evening. It is 5.30, so we're going to call the regular council meeting to order. I'd remind you to turn your cell phones to silent or vibrate, and then please let's all stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Amanda, would you please take the roll? Councilmember Stevens. Here. Councilmember Streeby. Here. Councilmember Dalby. Here. Councilmember Myers. Here. Councilmember Rowe. Here. Mayor Lazio. Here. Items on the consent agenda. Minutes from regular meeting number 39 on November 21st, 2017 is presented. Appointment of Catherine Wellburner to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, term to expire December 12, 2022. 
purchase a John Deere utility tractor and 11 foot rear mower for the parks department for $45,500 from Sinclair Tractor. Payment to Chestnut Siding Company in the amount of $4,517 for the South Fire Station installation project. Remove outdated and or inapplicable policies from the city policy manual. Resolution number 256, 2017, approving the work as final and complete and approving final pay requests for the phase five division three of the 2016 sewer rehab project. Resolution number 258, 2017, approving the contract, bond and certificate of insurance for the East Main Street reconstruction project. Resolution number 262, 2017, setting the date for a public hearing on the disposition of city owned property located at 1230 South Sheridan. Beer and or liquor applications, Casey's General Store number 2208, 1603 West 2nd Street, La Guadalupana, 301 Church Street, El Rancho Grande, 232 East Main Street, Casey's General Store number 1678, 346 Richmond, and the Owl's Nest Bar and Grill, 116 South Court Street, all applications pending final inspections. Is Move there a the motion? Yeah. Excuse me. Move the consent agenda as presented. Second. Take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Item C, I need an approval for tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. At this time, I'd like to call on City Administrator Andy Morris, and he's going to talk about some items that are under reports and uh, bring us up to date on some projects he's working on. So, Andy, you have the floor. Very good. Thank you, Mayor. The very first item you see listed, and this was mentioned at the previous meeting, just a reminder to everyone, particularly to uh, council members, and that's the home-based uh, Iowa meeting is going to be held December 7th. That's on Thursday at the Bridgeview Center from 3 to 5 p.m. As you well know, that's the program that the Chamber's worked on uh, pretty assiduously in the last couple of months that recognizes veterans and also tries to tie them into employment opportunities in the city of Atumman and Wapalo County. The next item you will note, attempting to schedule uh, website presentations. One of the items I've shared with council, I wanted to wait till we got into the new calendar year uh, because our schedules are kind of challenged this, this time of the year is to start looking at some of the presentations from those entities that have given us proposals for our website. As you well know, our website needs to be uh, updated and enhanced. Just to let you know, at present, I've got one scheduled for the 9th of January and another one scheduled for the 23rd. And in that order, Hill Productions and Civic Plus. Again, on, on the 9th and on the 23rd, those would be special meetings. I'm also getting some calls from uh, other entities uh, Neapolitan Labs is another one that I've spoken with recently. They may be an additional presentation, <laughs> but as it stands right now, those two are the uh, items, the ones I have lined up again in the month of, of January. Uh, Mayor, I'll turn this over to you in just a moment. And this relates to uh, uh, Brett, Brad Little and uh, Brett Douglas are here, is here from uh, Genus Plus to give a presentation on the street state master plan. With that, Mayor, I will turn it over to you. Well, I think this would be appropriate to invite Brad and uh, Brett to come up and uh, introduce themselves. And uh, as Andy said, we are ready for an update. This is a big project for the city, and uh, we'd like to see what progress we've made. So, Brad, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mayor and City Council, for having us speak this evening. A little background. This is this topic I'm very excited about, and we've been talking about it as a community probably since 2012 or 13 as part of the Foundation's Reclaiming Main Street initiative. This is the same stream of consciousness that was brought us the parking lot, Canteen Alley, some of the other streetscapes, Market Street Bridge, all of the things that are around making our community more attractive, uh, more navigable, and easier to get around, but, but mainly more aesthetic and appealing to everyone. So the topic tonight, and I'm uh, pleased and my pleasure to introduce Brett Douglas with Genus Landscape Architect. We had a town hall meeting at Hotel Atumwa in May of 2015, where we really went public with Brett and his firm around this notion of a master streetscape plan for the Main Street District from the 100 block Washington Street over to Jefferson and our first big swing at what an entire streetscape program could look like from building front to building front and down below with infrastructure. 
And so to set the, sta the table for, for Brett, we've had great cooperation from Larry Seals and his department, from Jody, from Andy, uh, Joe Helfenberger before Andy, uh, previous mayors and administration. So this has been a long conversation that's gotten us to this point. And uh, along the way, Mike Heffernan with the water company, the utilities, and, and others that have really helped us try to vet all of the possible pitfalls and all the things we discover when we start going underground on our streets and sidewalks and that sort of thing. So this evening, Brett's going to give an update on the plan. We've been tweaking it ever since May of 2015, and I think we're now ready to really go public with this. So we're not asking the city council for anything this evening. We will be back. Uh, Brett will talk more about that for an ask and a commitment because we have a couple of uh, grant opportunities early next year. But tonight is really just to inform all of you, to share with you the plan, to field questions, and then to let you all digest uh, what we have to share this evening over the holidays. And then we all get back together in January and talk about uh, numbers and, and some commitments and some other grant opportunities that Area 15 Regional Planning has uh, kind of dug up for us. And, and then we'll really need to start talking about commitments and is this a go or a no-go. So with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce Brett Douglas with Genus Landscape Architect. So, thank you, Brad. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thanks for the opportunity to, to share this project. It's, I was telling Brad a little just last week that uh, I think we started uh, in the summer of 2014 working on the streetscape plan. And so we're a little over three years into this. And uh, in my 20 year career, this has been uh, absolutely one of the most rewarding uh, collaborations that I've experienced thus far in a little over three years in terms of what we've accomplished. Thanks. So you see, we started with diagrams. We started with conceptual plans uh, on paper of, of what we could do in downtown Tumla, realizing that uh, there were many opportunities to say the least. Next. You know, we moved into uh, what are the top priorities out of that top priority list. We started looking at opportunities through uh, some funding opportunities that came available through Iowa Economic Development Authority and the Jefferson Street parking lot. Uh, Main Street became apparent that that was a, a highlight area with all of the uh, facade work that was happening. Uh, what could a three block project look like? And then how could we take it even further? And that's where the Canteen Alley projects came about and how do those all lace together to capitalize on, on the wonderful improvements and could we really make it happen? Next. And you can see you're probably all very familiar with the Jefferson Street parking lot. This was really that, that first piece for us at a site level of how we take a basic urban parking lot and make it something more. How do we clean the water and make that a, a very attractive public space? And, and how do we set the bar for, for downtown Otomwa? Next. And then moving into phase one of Canteen Alley with the with help of the Otomwa Regional Legacy Foundation, we took a very small passageway and really made that a a vibrant uh, opportunity for pedestrian uh, pass through into next uh, phase two, which is under construction right now. These photos are a couple weeks old. We're, I think uh, completion is definitely on the horizon here. We're uh, maybe the last batch of concrete was poured today and the unit pavers will finish up here in a couple of weeks. And uh, with a little arm twisting, I think the public artists will get their uh, components finished within a few weeks. So we're getting really, really close and excited uh, everybody's been a good partner in this and I'm excited we're going to get this done here this year. Next. So now we're on to Main Street. Uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, effort by the Main Street Facade Program and what you guys have done in the little bit of time that I've been down here. Uh, the, the buildings are getting ready, the facades are there. What do we do to connect the dots? What do we do to improve the public infrastructure? Uh, make this ADA compliant, make this walkable, make it a safe, vibrant uh, connector for all of these great spaces. Next. So the plan, which is up here for the 100 block through the 300 block, really looks at maximizing your opportunity to, again, connect those dots with pedestrians. We're reorganizing the parking a little bit. So to make it more consistent of a sidewalk treatment for pedestrians, uh, all parking is proposed to be parallel. So we have one block that currently has some angled parking. Uh, making that shift, again, gives us nice, consistent sidewalks. We do lose a few parking spaces, and that's yet to be determined the final number there. Uh, but we're, there's a lot of uh, easy opportunities on the side streets to pick those parking spaces back up. Uh, your downtown is unique in that you currently have a, a mid-block crossing uh, that's promoted 
on, on each of those blocks. We've chosen to celebrate that mid-block crossing, which I'll talk about here shortly, uh, and add some amenities there. Uh, one of the things that we noticed when we first came to town in downtown Ottumwa is you lack trees. There are very few trees, very little green in downtown. We think this is an opportunity to invest in the soils and invest in the uh, planting areas so that we can grow trees. Uh, there's a lot of, of benefits to that, and that's a, a separate conversation, but uh, trees throughout the corridor are certainly going to help uh, the livability of Main Street. Next. Creature comforts, all those things that go into making a great public space. Uh, we've already started uh, here about a year ago. You've seen some new benches pop up across downtown, so providing seating, providing upgraded lighting, uh, LED lights to reduce your energy consumption, um, provide better photometrics across the sidewalks, across the streets, uh, unit pavers to warm some of the areas, uh, litter receptacles and banners to promote downtown and the tumble in general. And we really are, we're exploring, there are certainly no commitments at this point, but we're exploring green infrastructure opportunities. So where there are opportunities to take stormwater and treat that uh, before it goes into the storm system or absorb that and, and recharge our groundwater, we certainly uh, want to look at that and we'll come back to you at a later date and uh, show you what options there are. Next. So as I mentioned, the trees, you can see here, we're getting trees on approximately 30 foot spacing up and down both sides of the street. Next. And in terms of scale, if any of you have been to downtown Des Moines in the East Village, it just so happens, and this is about a block from my office, uh, our sidewalk section on Main Street is about identical to what uh, East Locust has in downtown. So approximately 13 width, foot width from the building face to the outside of the curb, you'd be looking at something very similar here. So it's about a six foot wide uh, pedestrian zone. And a lot of folks initially react to that and say, well, that's, that's not wide enough, we need more. But I think most would agree that there are more people, more density in downtown Des Moines and East Village here, and this works, works just fine every day of the week. Next. And so here's your section. Uh, again, parallel parking on the edges. We are narrowing the drive lanes just a little bit. That's still an acceptable width for, for buses and all your typical street traffic. That allows us, again, to promote pedestrian circulation, give a little bit back on the sidewalk zones. Next. Mid-block crossings. Next. We really want to highlight this and make it a feature. We see it as an opportunity to uh, create an area for public art uh, within the bump-out zones that you see in the paving. So this bump-out here and here is an area for public art. It's an area to drain stormwater into. Next. So you can see these gardens where we would have seating opportunities, planted landscape, calms traffic. It slows folks down through there as the road narrows here. But we really, if we're going to do this at a mid-block crossing, we really want to promote safety uh, there. So we really want to call out the difference in materials and have contrast in materials and narrow that roadway. Next. And you can see the diagram here of water running along the face of the curb at a curb inlet here and water would go into those garden spaces. Next. And then recharge and anything that was over more than capacity would have a way to get out through a pipe that would connect back up to the storm system. Next. The crossroads, uh, a lot of topography here in downtown Ottumwa. So we, we felt like the intersections, not only are they one of the more visible areas, pedestrians, but also to cars. You know, everybody's coming through in each direction of, at the crossroads. Next. It's really an opportunity for us to, to become an, what I'll call an urban sponge. So all of that rainwater that's coming down off the hill that's maybe coming too fast and misses those storm drains or bypasses because of that velocity, we, can, we have the opportunity, if the project moves in this direction, to pick that water up with permeable paving in the intersections. Next. And that might look something like this, where it's, it's a very warm pedestrian scale uh, intersection bump outs at all of the crosswalks. Those would be um, updated with uh, cast iron uh, truncated domes, which are very durable from a public works perspective. They handle the snow plows about as well as anything can. Uh, and those bump outs give us an opportunity for vegetation, and give us an opportunity to shorten that pedestrian crosswalk. So with each of those, uh, we're reducing that pedestrian crossing by 12 to 16 feet. So 
It's a much, much safer environment for pedestrians. Next. Bioswale and sidewalk filters. I would put this in the alternate category right now. It's one of those uh, components that we are exploring. Uh, we've been encouraged to explore this with, through the Iowa Economic Development Authority. There may be some grant opportunities with this. Next. And we're looking at this as, as possibly a uh, case study. Certainly these uh, treatments have been done before, but maybe we do two or three smaller elements on the 100 block in which we're taking stormwater off of the sidewalks or using permeable pavers in a unique way or doing a trial on silva cells or something that captures stormwater beneath the grade and promotes tree growth. So we're looking at various options, and again, that will come back in, in front of you if we think there's an opportunity that makes sense. So where do we go from here? In terms of cost projections, or projections, we are early stages of construction documents right now. There's a good deal of work uh, that has happened, and there's a good deal of work that needs to take place. Uh, we think right now that we're looking a little north of a $5.5 million project. And I, I will offer that in a conservative fashion right now, right now because it does contain public art monies. It has design contingency in there. Uh, that includes a construction administration allowance uh, and materials and labor escalation. So there are some factors built in there. Uh, and we've tried to be conservative with our unit costs right now. Next. Funding opportunities, how are we going to pay for this? Uh, Really what we're hoping for, or what I'm hoping for tonight is to give all of you an introduction to the project. One of the next steps here, as Brad mentioned, is to start considering grant opportunities. And if we're going to consider grant opportunities, it is a public infrastructure, a city of a tunnel project, and certainly would need council support in order to move forward in applying for those grants. So if, if there was any type of ask, it would, it would be for uh, all of you to consider uh, lending your support to the project to move forward in that uh, grant application process. We think there are monies, uh, well, we know there are monies available. We have to make a, we have to have a great project, which I think we do. Uh, we have to meet all of the, the timelines and the grant application material uh, and get that submitted here this year. You can see the dates there, a couple of them in April, but we've got a total of just shy of $2, $2 million of, of grant monies that are out there that we know of. Uh, and we think this project is a strong candidate for it. Certainly doesn't guarantee that we would receive those funds, but uh, again, with your support, we'd like to pursue those. Next. Next. Lastly, schedule. Uh, if the project moves forward as we think it could, uh, we would uh, apply for the grants and see how the monies come forward and adjust the project accordingly. <laughs> Uh, we do need to get in front of stakeholders again. So one of the typical things in a project like this is as we get down to the details, we like to meet with you know, everybody at the city, make things, make sure things are coordinated, but also meet with all business owners or property and or property owners, uh, things such as deliveries, the details, all of the nitty gritty has to be discussed for a project like this to take place. Uh, we think we could be completed if everything moves forward in a timely fashion with documents uh, in 2018, could put the project out to bid next winter, and we envision, given the scale of the project, uh, that it's likely a two-season construction process. So in the best case scenario, in terms of timeliness, we'd be looking at a 2019-2020 construction period, uh, project complete around November or December of 2020. Be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any immediate questions or comments? Brett, you might make some reference. Uh, you've done this in another community, uh, so we're not an experiment for you. You are not an experiment. We've, we've completed a number of projects uh, across Iowa, and uh, several in Des Moines, and, and just finished a big two and a half block project in downtown Iowa City uh, and gone through that process. Uh, so it's, it's not a new type of project or scale for us. I guess I got a comment, not Go so much a question, just a comment on the design and what I see so far on there um, and what we have planned also is our vision for the downtown. And I think the two just intermesh beautifully. I think it was a great presentation and I'm, I'm really anxious and excited about seeing, you know, where the, the grants fall, the funding falls and, and uh, what you might need from the city. So I'm excited about it. It's beautiful. This is something new that we've never had before and it uh, definitely goes along with the momentum we've got going now downtown. So I appreciate your work on it.
Thank you. Bet. I, I guess I would just echo what Councilman Dalby said. It, it, we've we've already seen a lot of good things start to happen over the last couple of years, and I think this will just push us to the next level. So um, I, I'm excited to see where this goes. I think, uh, Brett, you might mention, I know there's been some other discussion that with this timing that you've talked about, uh, if there's some grant um, funds available for 1819, it might uh, give us, the city, a little more time to look at financing through uh, planful decisions about 1920. Uh, can you just make a comment about that? Yeah, and I, I think that that fed a lot into our current timing. As you know, Mayor, we've been working on this project for a while and have kind of delayed, I won't say decision making, but just the timing of it and put a lot of strategy and thought into how we structure the project. And at one time it was a two block project and in conversations with uh, Mr. Seals and Legacy Foundation and others at the city, we moved it to a three block project uh, because we, we do think that expands our opportunity to think about how we handle it fiscally but it also opens up the scale of the project potentially, depending on the market, uh, to be a larger project, which we have a better draw for contractors. One of the challenges that we've experienced working in Ottumwa is there's a limited pool of contractors and getting good unit costs and good bids. Um, the scale of the project is important and certainly the timeliness of it. So we feel like we put ourselves in a good position and have been very thoughtful and strategic about moving the project forward. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, Brett, and thank you, Brad. We're looking forward to keeping in touch, and I appreciate the uh, cooperative relationship with our city uh, department heads that you've worked with and uh, keeping them posted so we know what's going on. So good communication. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to go back to Andy and uh, see if uh, you have a couple more items, I believe. Yes, Mr. Mayor, there are two items, and both of these are specific to the police department. The very first one you should have in front of you a memo, this is dated today, and this speaks to the issue of 12 hour shifts at the police department. This is something that was discussed at length this past summer. And the memo that was put together today, our apologies, you received one of these, I believe about a week ago. This is quite frankly, a bit of a, of a cleanup responsive memo to that memo to this. Joni Keith, our city attorney and I put this memo together. Ha that having been said, Chief McAndrews with us uh, here this evening, and Mayor, if it's all right with you and the council members would like the chief to uh, step forward and put in context anyway these 12-hour uh, shifts. Okay. Good evening, Chief. We're glad to hear from you. So. Good evening, Council and Mayor. As you know, we had uh, had a meeting here, uh, I believe in September, and uh, the council made recommendation to uh, move the patrol division to 12-hour shifts. Uh, the union had met, I believe, with several council members and, and discussed how they wanted to go to 12-hour shifts. Um, our standpoint uh, for the last couple of months has been that we just don't have enough, enough people to go to 12-hour shifts. Um, however, council uh, did vote on it and did uh, have us uh, start moving towards 12-hour shifts. We were supposed to go to 12-hour shifts in January. Um, however, on November 28th, my I reverberating here? Okay. Um, on November 28th, I received a email from union representatives of the, uh, of the Ottumwa Police uh, Union. Um, that would be John Thomas, who spoke at our uh, meeting, if you recall. Um, he said that uh, in his uh, email that it would be irresponsible and unreasonable to believe or even attempt to implement 12-hour shifts in January of 2018. Um, so what we're looking at is uh, the, the union is wanting to move that back to July of uh, next year. Um, so this was a legislative decision to go to 12-hour shifts. Um, I have uh, the council's recommendation to go to 12-hour shifts. I believe it was in 60 days. Um, so I think we're going to do a staff summary for the next council meeting and uh, ask the council to allow us to move back the 12 hour shifts at least until July of next year. Mr. Mayor, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do want to point out where I think it's good to get obviously some sense of the council. We're not asking for legislative action this evening. Though. That's correct. We are, we're preparing a staff summary and that'll be at the next council meeting. I'm asking for permission to delay the migrating to the 12 hour shifts. I would just want to note that 
we don't know how many people we're gonna have working next July. There's no guarantees that we'll have enough people working next July uh, to go to the 12 hour shifts. Um, as a, a, a side note, just today I was informed that one of my officers uh, that we just hired is going to be leaving for a year deployment with the National Guard uh, beginning in July. Um, so we also have people with medical issues. You just never know how many people you're going to have working. So it's pretty tough to set a hard date of moving to 12 hour shifts in July when we don't know how many people we're going to have working at that time. So um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll draft this uh, staff summary uh, to where you can recommend that we move to 12 hour shifts when we have enough people. Uh, that may not be July. We'll have to assess it at that point. Mr. Mayor, yeah. uh, one other item, uh, Chief, that you and I spoke about and, uh, and um, wish you would uh, mention it, and that relates to the issue of not just the 12-hour shifts, but also the, the issue of negotiation. Yes. Uh, we would like to be able to negotiate with the union on the 12-hour shifts. We're basically talking contract issues here. And we need to have the authority for me, the city administrator, the city attorney to meet with the union and negotiate going to the 12 hour shifts rather than just having uh, rather a mandate of you will go to 12 hour shifts. With uh, a mandate, um, we pretty much lose our power to negotiate. And I think we do need um, some authority to negotiate this topic rather than um, have a mandate. <clears throat> I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about that. Any questions for the chief? Any comments? Your Honor, I got a quick question here. <clears throat> chief, I know this was, this was kind of a, a tough transition or attempt for a transition, but first, first of all, uh, I, I can remember back when we passed this and presented this, and uh, I think there may have been some confusion. Uh, you know, our, our, uh, what we said and what we passed was implementing immediately. Right, or within 60 days. And I think most of us up here, you know, uh, know that, that sometimes things come up that aren't possible. Uh, manpower, obviously, you know that better than anybody else. And I don't think this council is going to stand in the way of working with you and, and giving you room to, to implement this only when it works. I mean, there's no point in implementing it if it doesn't work or you don't have enough people. And I think we all, we all realized that and knew that. Um, just a quick question. When you, when after we passed this, this action, um, were you able to then sit down with the union and negotiate at that point? Some it's details. really not much of a negotiation because um, council voted on it and we were told to go to the 12 hour shifts. Um, we want to be able to negotiate with the union. Maybe we'll go to 12 hour shifts, maybe, maybe we won't. Both sides want something and right. both of us have to give and take a little bit in order to, to come to this 12 hour shifts. I'm not opposed to the 12 hour shifts at all. I think that we do need to be able to negotiate, however, uh, with the union. This is gonna be, uh, a very expensive proposition. Uh, we're hiring three people. Um, we went from 2,080 hours to 2,184 hours, I believe. Um, that's, a, that's another position. Each officer is going to be working another 100 hours a year, and uh, I think we need to negotiate over uh, topics like that. Johnny, this may be a question for you, and I'm sorry, Bob, I cut you off. Um, when we went to this 12-hour shift, we were we did some investigating on our own and in the state of Iowa as far as public uh, safety officials being able to work an extended amount of hours without paying overtime. Was that Does that apply here in this case? We're talking about a big expense or an increase in expense here. I was, I was unaware that this would be a, a huge increase once we had the personnel to do it. Uh, fair labor standards dictate when overtime needs to be paid. Uh, under the current union contract, it's overtime after eight hours. Uh, However, under Fair Labor Standards, there's a distinction for law enforcement. And uh, for instance, overtime's not paid for the fire department until 56 hours occurs. So there'll be some changes uh, that we, and, and we've started the negotiation process. It's just by the, the mandate kind of handicapped us in our ability to negotiate. But uh, yeah, that will affect the amount of overtime, but again, you've got to remember you're adding 100 hours per uh, officer per year, so their budget is going to be different, uh, quite a bit higher than um, would have been uh, the case under an eight-hour, uh, 40 hour, regular 40-hour 
uh, work week. Thank you for that. Okay. Carlos Monroe. It, it's my understanding, and maybe this is this is one of those uh, issues like what Councilman Dalby was saying, when the spirit of when we made this uh, recommendation was that the contract, at least to some extent, would be opened up anyway because we would, we would be negotiating uh, not only the 12-hour shifts but some compensation elements as well. So um, I, I don't think anybody was against the idea of opening, opening that whole piece of the contract up for negotiations. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, Joni, we specifically dis discussed um, the having the ability to negotiate certain pieces of that. So I don't think that anybody up here really had a problem with opening the contract up to begin with. Okay. Councilman Myers. Yeah. And Councilman Rowe, I think you're, you're incorrect in that I was concerned in the very beginning that that being a council mandate as opposed to going through negotiations properly. Uh, and I want to follow that with a question for um, Attorney Joni. Um, what also concerns me, even the way this is now going, is uh, typically contracts are for a, a certain period of time. And I know there are cases where uh, either side can ask to reopen. And uh, what concerns me about this is the way this is being done, in fact, with with the union now coming back, wanting to reopen as opposed to waiting until the actual uh, regular bargaining time, does that open this council, this city up to each of our unions, in fact, may now step forward with, we want to reopen or we want to negotiate even though it's not the uh, correct contract time? Contracts can only be re reopened at the mutual agreement of both parties. Um, so both parties have to be willing to do that. If not, the contract goes as uh, negotiated and until the end of that term of that contract. Here when council you know, mandated that we go to the 12-hour shifts, they directed us to uh, negotiate that 12-hour 12, 12 shift. Um, but it also took a, took away to some extent our ability, uh, our negotiating position. Uh, but that being said, uh, we're willing to work with the union. Uh, we're cons we are definitely concerned about our numbers and whether it will work because if we implement this, we want it to work. So we've had a number of meetings with the unions. In fact, uh, uh, union representatives will be here on the 19th, this will be brought back to council. Uh, the memo is just for your review. Uh, you can um, ask questions of us. You can um, uh, before that time, but it will be brought back to council on the 19th of December to give us authority to uh, postpone it until at the earliest July of 2018 and to help us to be in a better bargaining position for negotiations as well. That's what we're going to be requesting. All right. And I just want to follow that up with, with, um, you know, I like your explanation. I mean, I understand it, but, um, it's really the prerogative, uh, uh, we mandated it. So for the union then to say, yes, we'll do it. It's up to them to make sure that they're representing, uh, their membership as opposed to, uh, a select few or whatever else. That's up to them. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Councilman Rowe, did you have a comment? Well, I just wanted to point out that I, I don't believe that given the, the circumstance that, um, and, and I, I said it before and I'll say it again, I don't think it was incorrect for the, the council to step in. It was a dire position. And I don't think that this, I do think that it was an anomaly that the council would have to step in in this situation and if I had to do it over again, I would because we had police officers that were in that were in a critical state. So I, I don't think that it was wrong of council to do what we did. Okay. I'd like to echo what Councilman Dalby and Rowe said. When we had these discussions uh, and that decision was made, it was predicated upon the fact that there would be enough personnel to handle 12-hour shifts. 
I don't think any of us up here that voted for that uh, were under the impression that 12 hour shifts were possible without the required number of, of officers. So the, the movement was to get more officers and then to move to 12 hour shifts and hopefully those things would fall into place. And certainly we're open to discussions about negotiations and uh, are certainly not firm on closing any doors. This was in an attempt to give officers more safety, uh, the ability to do their job more effectively and to give them some home life and some time with their families. Well said. Okay. Okay, so you've got the memo in front of you. They'll come back with a staff recommendation at the 19th meeting. We'll have plenty of time and the police representative will be here with you and uh, we'll go take that on at that point. Good, all right, Andy, anything yes. else? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, one uh, additional item, and this relates to the uh, creation of additional patrol supervisors and would, would uh, like Chief McAndrew to speak to this issue. So we are, um, Moving towards the 12 hour shifts, uh, part of uh, planning for that, we're now budgeting. Uh, we have to have our budgets in before this all goes into place. So we're moving forward, we're staying positive, we're gonna make it to 12 hour shifts. Um, we had a meeting on September 25th after uh, council gave us a recommendation, uh, I believe as the mayor and Councilman Dalby and Councilman Rowe. And if you remember, we had the, the charts on the board and, and we're talking about how to best make the 12 hour shifts work. And we uh, agreed that uh, after we looked at everything that it would be, uh, it would help the 12 hour shifts to be successful if we promoted two more sergeants to be on each one of those groups. If you remember, there's four groups. We only have one sergeant in charge of each group. We need two in, in charge. Um, so we need two more uh, sergeants to uh, be assigned to those groups to make the 12 hours work. So uh, we're doing our budgeting process right now. So we've got to uh, get on the ball. So we're ready uh, in July if we, if we do this. So I'll be asking at the next council meeting to uh, create those two positions. So we'll have the supervisory staff ready to go. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, very good. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Andy, anything else? Yes, I have. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the only thing, Chief, I would mention, and this is just a personal thing, we had a, uh, a great ceremony down at your uh, law center on last Thursday. We recognized four of your offices for their valor and their and their uh, safety to our fire department. Actually, um, I would really encourage your uh, awards committee when you know there's going to be some uh, recognition that we do that publicly here. Uh, we had uh, a lot of family and uh, relatives that were present, and I think we should honor those people publicly and. Uh, give them the same recognition we do other city employees. So right. if you can work that out, that'd be great. There'll be another one after the case is closed. The reason that uh, the public wasn't invited to that uh, was because this is an open case. And if we do it publicly, we run the chance of an attorney saying we need to move this to another county sure. or something like that. So as a private ceremony, someday when the case is resolved, which could be a year from now, we didn't want to wait that long to uh, recognize these employees. We'll have those guys come back and I will represent them their awards that they received. Very good, great. Chief, was the news media notified on this first one that you're talking about on Thursday or was that a case where you really- No, didn't... we don't want the media there. We don't really want any media attention because it could uh, slant. Uh, an attorney's gonna come in and say, well, these guys have been received awards. Uh, yeah, I understand. And, yeah, so. but even if the case was closed, you could could you include the news media? Yeah, if, it would be totally different if this case was completely over and the criminal and civil was all over with. Then we would have the media there, and we'd made a big deal out of it. Very good, thank you, Chief. Item E in our agenda. Is there anyone in the audience that wants to address an item on the agenda? And we do have one so far. Um, We'll call you at the time that that item is being discussed and give you a chance to uh, make your comments at that point. So let's move to item F. Approve the financial and staff support for the Fly Ottumwa Air Show. Recommendation, determine if the Fly Ottumwa Air Show meets the requirements to be a city sponsored event with financial and staff support. Move the recommendations presented. Second. Any questions or who's going to cover that, I guess? Councilman Dowdy. Well, I don't know if you want anybody to read the summary or. Sure. I was just gonna make a comment on it. I don't know if you want to have somebody read the summary first or do you want me to just. No, I think we should there? read the summary. Joni, would you do, us, do the honor and uh, highlight that please? 
I'd be glad to, Your Honor. Uh, in the summer of 2017, the city hosted the Fly Iowa Air Show at the Ottumwa Airport. This two-day event was very successful and brought in 20,000 people to watch the two-day show. The airport committee and their airport committee uh, committee had uh, proposed that the city hold another two-day show in August of 2018. The airport committee wants the city council to endorse this event and authorize the city administrator to work with the air show committee to provide police and fire personnel, public works, and airport staff to assist in providing in-kind work and support to make the show a reality. As part of the endorsement, the city will apply for the liquor license and additional event insurance to cover the event. Now, I think it'd be appropriate for any questions or comments, uh, Matt. Well, I certainly uh, uh, want to say that's a uh, talk to the success of the Fly Iowa event we had out at the airport. That was an amazing show. And the best part about it was it was, you know, there was no admission fees. And so I took my family to it. I had a great time. I think I know the citizens do too as well. And, uh, you know, I would definitely uh, endorse, uh, you know, having another event at the, at the airport, uh, even on a yearly basis. I mean, we even got some, some reachers and feelers out for a, a small commercial air service. So, we reaped a lot of rewards from that one air show. However, one thing I would say is, and I've discussed this before, uh, when we do events in the city um, and, and call them free, they're actually not free. We have to you know, pay personnel and we have to pay uh, insurance and stuff. And most of the time, and like with the Flow event, it was no big deal. Uh, but I think maybe moving forward before uh, we commit to financials uh, on an event or events, we come up with uh, you know, a policy that, that kind of puts a top dollar limit on that. So uh, you know, we're in kind of a, a uh, a time where we have to watch every dollar and so I would just think it'd be good uh, a good action by the council or a consideration by the council uh, to look at a policy um, and see how much we want to spend on these events each year because we may very well may have more uh, obviously we're having more uh, events that people want to attend and and I certainly support them and endorse them and love them and go to them and I think the people do too but uh, I think we do need a policy um, and I would be curious to what the other members think Mark and and I would again agree with what Councilman Dalby said. There was a there was an event uh, here a couple of years ago in, in town that that uh, obviously had a lot of expense tied to it. And and I sat as the one of the finance co chairs of that. And I remember writing a couple of rather large checks to the city of Ottumwa to to pay for overtime expenses, uh, public works expenses, spray paint things like that. Um, you know, it's it, again. I think it's great also that we have all these public events, but um, we we need to be cognizant of the fact that this is taxpayer dollars that we're dealing with, and we 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 do need to be uh, careful not to spend it in in a way that is not best in the, in the best interest of the taxpayer and. If we want to have uh, city-sponsored events, there has to be some accountability by the organization that's putting it together to uh, make sure that the, the true cost of, of the event is covered by them. Mr. Myers. Yeah. Well, and I sure agree with uh, Matt and with Mark that uh, Future Council developed some types, uh, some type of guideline. Uh, but specifically back to this issue, I think it's a win-win um, based on most of us having had experience out there uh, this last year with the Fly Iowa and and the fact that we're looking at a uh, possible uh, flying service coming in, I would suggest to you that it's uh, certainly possible that the experience of that Fly, in, Fly Iowa this last uh, summer may be a part of that. So I would encourage you at least for this one uh, to have the city in Boris going ahead for this uh, 2018 project. Mr. Mayor, one, one last uh, uh, question or comment on this as it relates to developing a, a policy. That's certainly something staff can do if that's the desire of, of council. Obviously, it will not, it should council decide to endorse this this evening, there won't be enough time to do that. I can certainly work with staff and reach out to some other outside agencies and, and put something together. One of the items I know we, we have spoke about, one of the items I think that needs to be addressed uh, in any policy that's developed as it relates to subsidies or assistance or go as far as endorsement is the issue of public versus private dollars, which is a legal issue, as we all know, where you have to be very careful and meticulous about mixing uh, public dollars for private events. 
So that's something that I would, if, if again, if that's the desire of council, we'll certainly move on that, but that's certainly an element I, I think needs to be added to the, uh, the, the corpus of the policy. Thank you. I got a quick question for Joni. Sure. Joni, what do you think might be a rough time frame to have a policy developed? I know this this takes into account a lot of events and things we've had here for years, and and you know about parades and, and things like that. You know, how how long would that take to write a policy that would be detailed enough to have something in front of us? I mean, we all want to support it, and and, and you know be financially you know uh, accountable to a certain point, but I just think we need a policy out there that kind of gives a top dollar so we're all protected. It's not going to be done overnight, and there's well, a lot of ramifications to think about what you want to incorporate in that policy. So I would say uh, probably the first of the year would be the yes. earliest, don't you think? And Mr. Mayor, I, I would say the same thing in, in, in that regard. I think if we get at, sometime after the first year, you're right, because what I, I would want to do in, in addition to finding out policies from other cities is also speak with uh, outside legal counsel and see what some of their thoughts are. I'm sure we could piece one together pretty easily and I, I can reach out to some entities and of course uh, Ms. Keith will go ahead and review that but again I, I, I don't know that that would be something we'd be able to develop in the next say you know 20 25 days well these are just my thoughts um, I would be interested in what the council thinks about postponing it or endorsing this one and then having a policy follow this up or or what they want to do because I'm either way on this or the chair would entertain a friendly amendment that we could uh go ahead and endorse the event and and limit or set a not to disclose the night any financial commitment until we know uh, more about that and also give the staff plenty of time to check with other cities yeah. mr mayor just, just a thought on that it seems to me you you could almost divorce those two could you not i'm looking at yes. joni on this one i mean you you could the, the very first item would be whether council endorses this event, and if they do, then that's all good and well. Separate that. Then you move on to the policy. But if you, the policy mm -hmm. the policy lined up with this, I think it just creates a layer of complexity. Yeah, I would agree with that. If we can separate the two uh, and do a, 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 a late, amount later for this one event, but yet endorse it, because I think we all do, and I think we all know it's going to have to have some in-kind, you know, contribution from the city. Uh, but you know, at least it's a first step, you know, setting a policy. So. Um, I don't know how to frame the motion. Except would you for, like to offer a friendly amendment? I would Mr. offer Mayor, an amendment. Mr. Mayor, I, I don't want to interrupt, but one, one item that I, I just got to thinking about that, that does need to be addressed, and that is as it relates to the city's contribution, we, we may want to give some consideration then to, let, let's just, in, in the past then, we've been reimbursed for overtime salaries of certain public uh, safety employees. Uh, I, I, I don't know that that has to be, uh, and fold it into the motion. That's just something that uh, staff is certainly going to look at and, and try and pursue that. I know that it's, we've been successful in those endeavors with both RAGRI and the uh, Fly Iowa event, but I just want to put that out there to council. In the past, we have been reimbursed. That's, at a minimum, something I would like us to investigate. Well, further. I think, if you, if you don't mind, that, that's kind of what I was referring to, was the reimbursement of those, those expenses. Yeah, and that's, uh, Councilman Rowe, that's a good point. In the past, we have been reimbursed, so I, I don't want to I, it's obviously not my job to say we will or we not, will not be reimbursed. That's some of the precedent that the city has followed, and, and that's certainly something staff will pursue. Again, we can still we, we can address that now, but we can also in the future address what this policy is going to look like a couple of months from now. I guess I would ask back to the question, isn't this on the agenda tonight simply to state whether we would endorse it or not? Well, it says uh, with financial and staff support. Yeah, based on a proposal coming forward to you. But right now, I thought it was just, would we endorse that? Am I? It does reference financial. Yeah. yeah. And I wouldn't be willing personally to vote on something when we don't have a clear number in place. Uh, I would recommend that the uh, proposal be something to the effect that you're endorsing the event mm -hmm. any future possible financial or staff support would be determined at a later date if any that's i i mean I, I i i would agree with what uh, attorney keith said right? that we we can we can slay that dragon later i would offer what joni said as a friendly amendment if that's okay i want to check with amanda be sure we have the wording so we we're endorsing the event. The city council would endorse the event, but any future financial and staff reimbursement would be determined, determined later. 
I would second Are that. Are you clear on that? Okay, there's any a multi staff and a support, one. not reimbursement. Any staff support, if any, would be determined at a later date and brought back before council. All right, so we have an amendment made by Mark, seconded by, uh, or by Bob, and seconded by Mark. Are you clear on that, and can we take a vote on that first? Okay, take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Okay, now let's go back to the original motion. Vote on the motion as amended. As amended. So you're clear on we're lim eliminating the financial and staff support. We're just endorsing the event. Take the roll then. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Thank you very much for that clarification. Let's move on to G. This is the time, place, and date set for a public hearing on the three-year lease agreement between the City of Ottumwa and the Ottumwa Saddle Club for acreage on Emma Street. I received no objections on this item. Good evening, Gene. You have the floor. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The city has been renting approximately 11 acres on Emma Street next to the Ottumwa Transit Offices to the Ottumwa Saddle Club for its equine events for many years. The lease agreement is similar to those in the Ottumwa Parks, made with local baseball, softball, and scouting groups. The Saddle Club would continue to pay the city the sum of $10 per year, pay to maintain the structures it has erected, and pay all maintenance and utility costs for the usage of said area. This will be a three-year lease agreement, and the club will provide standard liability insurance listing the city as an additional insured attached as a copy of the proposed lease agreement. This is a public hearing, so if there's anyone that wants to address this item, now's the time to step to the microphone. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, Scoot. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 227, 2017, approving the three year lease agreement between the city of Ottumwa and the Ottumwa Saddle Club for the acreage on Emma Street. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 227, 2017. Move the recommendation is presented. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Any questions for Gene? Any comments? Okay, take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Thank you, Gene. This is the time, place, and date set for a public <laughs> hearing on the disposition of city owned property located at 1021 South Madison. I received no objections on this item. Good evening, Jody. You have the floor. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Mike Shelton, who um, owns and operates Mike's Tire and Alignment, offered the city $250 for 1021 South Madison. He wants to use the property for his business and perhaps to put up a new building. The property is zone C2, which is consistent with the zoning on the rest of his business property and staff recommends accepting his offer. This also is a public hearing. Is there anyone that wants to address this item? Seeing none, then let's close the public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 245, 2017, accepting the offer and approving the sale of city-owned property located at 1021 South Madison, to Mike Shelton for the sum of $250. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 245, 2017. Is there a motion? Move the recommendation as presented. Second. Any questions for Jody? Take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. This is the time, place, and date set for a public hearing on the disposition of city-owned property located at 343 East Park Avenue, Ottumwa, Iowa. I received no objections on this item. We'll recognize Gene Ratchie, our Parks Director. Gene, you have the floor. The city of Ottumwa currently owns 343 East Park Avenue. Ottumwa, on behalf of the Ottumwa Cemetery Board of Trustees, this property is adjacent to the cemetery but is no longer needed. The cemetery board listed this property with an Ottumwa realtor to sell. The board received a written offer from Alan M. Stubbs for the sum and amount of $54,080. 
payable on closing with the seller paying $2,080 of the closing costs. The board has voted to accept this offer. However, because the city actually has the title to the property, a public hearing must be held before the sale can be completed. Cemetery board is requesting that the sale be approved by the city council and believes the offer establishes the fair market value for said real estate attached as a copy of the written offer. This also is a public hearing, so if there's anyone that wants to address the council. <laughs> seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Thank you. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 248, 2017, accepting the purchase offer and approving the sale of city-owned property located at 343 East Park Avenue, Ottumwa, Iowa, to Alan M. Stubbs. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 248, 2017. Is there a motion? Move the recommendation as presented. Second. Thank you. Any questions for Gene? Yeah, I have one. Go uh, ahead. Seems reasonable. Uh, I just have a question about why it's no longer needed. What does that language refer to? What was it needed for? originally or before well the way i understand it sometime in the late 70s the cemetery board <clears throat> purchased three houses along park avenue because they had planned on demolishing those houses to expand their uh, burial spaces um, <clears throat> after they did more research they realized that those houses weren't needed and the property wasn't needed so they've been renting them out ever since and uh, <clears throat> basically the cemetery board has decided at this point they want to get out of the real estate business as much as possible and focus on cemeteries. So that's why they want to sell this property. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. This is the time, place, and date set for a public hearing on the plans, specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost for the parking ramp repairs project. I received no objections on this item. Good evening, Larry. You have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Council. This is one of the items that we want to get ahead of preventative maintenance on the parking ramp structure. Uh, Dwight has done an evaluation and put together a small presentation. We'll cover the deficiency items that we're looking at. Okay. As soon as he cues it up. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Good evening, Council. Um, I just want to start out and just go through a few series of pictures that shows you some of the problems that I saw with the parking ramp and what this project will, will uh, uh, rectify. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the lower slab on grade. And right there, you can see that old caulk line. That was the original caulk line. This slab here, has settled a good eight inches. And fortunately, it's not a structural component of the ramp, so uh, this isn't a real cause for concern. But what is a concern is that because of the settling, it has changed the way the water is running off of this uh, parking ramp. I can have the next one. Uh, through that, throughout that lower slab, you'll see areas where the concrete has spalled and cracked. Next one. And on the outside, you can actually see where water is starting to come through the outside wall. So instead of the water being directed towards the floor drains, it's being directed to the perimeter. It runs down the wall and finds a place to escape. Next one. Here's another area where the water is coming out from underneath. Next. Now this is a joint between the precast panels. The double T precast panels comprise the floor of the parking ramp. And in each of these areas, there are two steel clips that are spaced about four feet on center. These steel clips are welded together and they perform and they provide stability throughout the entire structure. Because of the vehicles running over the top of them, they're subjected to a tremendous amount of vibration. In time, they weld, these welds break. And that's what we're seeing here at these places. You can see a little bit of concrete starting to break away there as well as up here. Now, if we can go to the next, if we go to the underneath side and take a look at that, you'll see these areas of concrete have completely spalled out. So if we do not repair the problem, it was just simply going to continue to get worse and possibly even jeopardize the structural integrity of that precast T. 
Next. Here's another joint. You can see right there where the cock joint, you can see daylight through it. That's typical throughout uh, the entire parking ramp. These joints need to be recocked, and that's, that's part of the scope of the work. Um, we've had to send somebody over there several times this summer uh, to try to keep it leak free so that we're not creating problems to the tenants that are parking there. Next. Here's an open horizontal joint that's just completely open that needs to be resealed. Next. Uh, the precast panels have a three inch concrete topping over the top. This area right here is completely eroded. I don't think the quality of the concrete that was used here is very good. And from each freeze thaw cycle that we're seeing, we're gonna see uh, uh, more erosion there. So our, our repair plan is to cut this out and replace it. Next. A good portion of the repairs is going to include epoxy injection. This is on the lower level, but you can see right here, there's a crack that goes from down there all the way up to there. And it may be a settlement crack. It may be, it may be uh, because we have differential movement between the structure and this, this is actually a retaining wall here that we're having differential movement there. But anyway, uh, at this point, we're recommending that that crack be uh, receive the epoxy injection. If you look at the stem of this precast, that it is actually about an inch above this concrete ledge here. So if we can get that uh, uh, support back in that uh, precast piece, we don't have to worry about the loss of the structural issues there. Next. One other thing that we observed, there is a lateral crack across many of the precast members. And these are other areas that we're just calling for that to be receive epoxy injection. Here's that another, another uh, precast piece. The uh, lateral crack has actually gone down into the stem, which if we don't fix that, that will become a cause for concern. And that's all I have on the, on the pictures. This uh, parking ramp, I think, was put in service back in 2005. You uh, can expect about 40 to 50 years of service on a parking ramp. <coughs> we're approaching year 15. Uh, the opinion of cost for the repairs that we're planning to do is about $143,000. For a structure of this age, that's quite a bit of money. Um, I think there um, is the potential that over the life cycle of these of this parking ramp that you may see above average cost to keep uh, this parking ramp under repair. Is the parking ramp safe? Absolutely. What I'm saying is just it's going to be an av above average cost to keep the parking ramp maintained. Any questions? Just to comment, Dwight, uh, uh, I'm glad that you're doing what you and the engineering staff's doing what you're doing because this type of maintenance has been lax for a long, long time. And I think if you continue on, and I know you've been to both fire stations and Bridgeview, and, and if you continue on, we're going to get to the point where we're not spending a boatload of money on problems after we let them go too far. And I appreciate your efforts. I think it's a thing to do. Thank you. This is a public hearing, so if there's anyone in the audience that wants to address this item, now is the time to step up. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. I just would like to ask... Uh, the would you, for the record, just identify yourself. We know who you are, but yep. people at home well, may Keith not. Keith Cavanis, 2851 Oak Meadow Drive. Thank you. I should have that down by now. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, interested in what the average cost of maintenance for a facility like this is. I heard this gentleman tell me that it's going to cost more than average, but I don't know what average is. And I was on council when that was erected, and we thought we were getting a good project and a good bid. So I'd just be interested in knowing what the average cost of a facility of this size might be. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Anyone else? 
I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Thank you. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 253, 2017, approving the plans, specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost for the parking ramp repairs project. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 253, 2017. Is there a motion? Move the recommendation as presented. Second. Any questions for Larry or Dwight? I have a couple, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead, Mark. So it seems in looking at this, that's, and my construction uh, knowledge is rather limited, but it seems like this is a lot of, a lot of repairs that needs done for, for the short amount of time that has been up. And, and you kind of alluded to that with the cost that we're gonna have to spend to get it up, which I, I agree with Councilman Stevens, uh, it's high time we started being a little bit more proactive as a community instead of letting things fall to the point where it costs us a huge chunk of change. But why is it that, that this has come to such a disrepair in such short order? Is it, is it because of the ground that it's sitting on that's causing that? Is it the materials? Is it some combination thereof? A lot of the settlement occurred because in the original, uh, funding and bidding it come in substantially over uh, there was an attempt to value engineer one of the things that was removed from the contract was core out of existing basement fill which included a lot of building fill uh, it saved some initial cost i know at the time it was discussed you will pay later that's where you see eight inches of settlement okay any other questions or comments victor I just have a comment. I'm not opposed to the recommended repairs. This is more of a just a thought piece for council. I think we ought to have some discussions about the utility of that parking ramp. I've, I've spoken with business owners and uh, when we think about streetscapes and when we think about improving the downtown blocks and the areas, I, I think that we need to take a look at you know how that parking ramp is utilized, who uses it, who has rights to certain parts of it and uh, make it such that we can maximize its utility and uh, for the sake of the business owners and, and for people who visit downtown, I think we need to kind of take a look at that and, and maybe think about that a little bit more going into the next year. Councilman Myers? Yes, well, having been on the council for a few terms, my comment, I know it's a little defensive, but unlike uh, Councilman Stevens and Rowe, it's, it, it doesn't sound to me like this is one that lacked maintenance over these years. It sounds to me, Dwight, like you're suggesting that the con, uh, the construction, whether it's the panels or whatever else, was maybe not the quality that we uh, that we expected be uh, being built into it. And then also, Dwight, could you answer Mr. Cavanaugh's question? Is there a way that you can answer it? Uh, what would the average is there, is there an average maintenance cost? Uh, I can do some research and come up with that uh, information. That's that's something that I'm not gonna be able to pull right off the top of my head, but it'll take a fair amount of research and Thank time. You. We can we can pull that together. It's not gonna be something I can do overnight or, right. or in a few days. It's gonna be some, it's gonna take some research. Okay, and, and I understand, and I, I know Mr. Cavanaugh says too, um, you, you've got to compare apples and apples. So for you to be able to say, well, it definitely should have lasted 25 years prior to any of this being done, I understand you can't do that, so. But to answer the first part of your question, I do believe there are some quality issues involved with this uh, ramp. Uh, the, those lateral cracks in the precast, I have not seen that before, and I went to school on a number of uh, parking ramps up in Cedar Rapids. Um, so there are some quality control issues that I don't think were addressed at the time of construction. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I got a possible comment and question. Uh, there's no doubt that that, that parking ramp has served uh, the parking needs downtown very well. However, I, I agree and would echo what, what council member Streeby said. It's not, I don't believe it's being utilized to its full potential at all. I don't, when I'm in there, I see the whole top half uh, un, uh, unpopulated. But anyway, that's beside the point. If it were to get more use, Pending a parking study or other ways of uh, assigning parking or whatever we decide to do there, would it handle that extra traffic? Say that thing was full all the time, 
with the quality issues you bring up, would you think it would, I mean, would it last 10 years, 20 years, or would it be safe for all that weight? Well, your worst case scenario would be if it's full all the time, which just means that there's more maintenance items that have to be addressed on a, a more needed basis. It's not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> but thank you for being honest. Okay. I, I think the other thing we might comment on is there is a parking lot study going on right now with the uh, regional planning commission and maybe they will have some data that we don't have right now that'll help us later on. So when they have that completed, they can share that with the council. And I think that will give us a, a total picture of what's going on with all of our parking lots. So, okay. All right. Motions made and seconded. Any other final questions? If not, take, take the roll, Amanda. Councilmember Stevens. Yes. Councilmember Streeby. Yes. Councilmember Dalby. Yes. Councilmember Myers. Yes. Councilmember Rowe. Yes. This is the time, place, and date set for a public hearing on the plans, specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost for the beach renovations phase three project 2018. I received no objections on this item. Okay. Gene, looks like you're back up. <laughs> okay, this portion of the beach renovations phase three includes five requests for proposals and consists of the following. Uh, number one, shade structure repair. Number two, LED lighting replacement. Number three, electronic entrance sign. Number four, sound equipment installation. And number five, lagoon and beach landscaping. Proposals will be received and opened by the City of Ottumwa on January 10th, 2018. The RFP response report and award recommendations will be presented at the City Council meeting on January 16th, 2018, or at a later date as determined by the staff. Construction for these RFPs is expected to occur this coming construction season with each RFP having a unique completion date. <clears throat> uh, estimated engineer's opinion of cost, shade structure repair, $10,000, LED lighting replacement, $12,000, electronic entrance sign, 100,000, sound equipment installation, 50,000, and lagoon and beach landscaping, 15,200. And at this point, I'm going to hand off to our city engineer and let him uh, make a presentation on this subject. RFP number one, which is the shade structure repair, it's a pretty straightforward project. We're just trying to do some repairs. And uh, um, Nancy Emanuel and uh, some of her friends have volunteered to paint it. So what this RFP comprises of just uh, uh, repairing the shade structures to get it ready for, for paint. And what we are doing on is there's this group of three over here, this group of three up here, this group of four here, and this one out here in the park. Those are the, four, those are the uh, 11 structures that are going to be worked on. RFP number two, which is the LED lighting, this is in the... Uh, um, the indoor pool facility and the reason we're, we are moving forward on this is because we already have a contract awarded to repaint the pools. So during the month of March, these pools are going to be drained, which is going to be the ideal time for us to replace these lights. So um, all these HID lights up here are going to get replaced with LED. Uh, next photo. This is above the training pool. You can see in the reflection here that we've got uh, linear fluorescent lights. Those will be replaced with uh, LED as well. Now, RFP number three is electronic entrance sign. This is the, this is the current sign, and it is deteriorating, to say the least. Uh, you can see over here, we got straps that are kind of holding this end together. Um, I know Gene has been wanting to get the sign change for, uh, for quite a while. So what our plans are is to remove this and uh, in the same place we would put an electronic sign. Um, next slide is a concept of something, this is similar to what the Bridgeview Center sign is, where we have a static sign up above which has the beach logo and then down below is two to four electronic uh, LEDs uh, two to four lines of uh, uh, lettering display, uh, about 24 feet high, about 12 feet wide, and uh, 
So that would be RFP number three. RFP number four, I don't have any visuals for you. That's a sound and, uh, sound equipment replacement. I think you all have been out to the beach and know that the sound equipment and sound system out there is subpar, so this will replace that. Now the last RFP, this is the lagoon and beach landscaping. What we are proposing to do um, in, the, in the beach, in the swimming pool area, there are three areas where we've removed all the vegetation. Um, Alicia Hook has come in and planted natives back in, in this area, but in these, these uh, three areas that are painted red, we're gonna go back there with something that's for the most part maintenance free, and that's that RTF side, like what you've seen in the parking lot, the Jefferson Street parking lot. So before the pool opens up this next uh, summer, that side will be in place. Now, another part of that RFP is we're going to plant native flowers and grasses along a 15 foot buffer along this lagoon. Now, from what I found out uh, way back when the DNR came in here and uh, gave us some ideas on how to manage the geese. And one of their recommendations is to do this buffer along the lagoon. Anything that the geese cannot see through, they will not go through. Um, they may fly over the top of it, but they won't walk through it. So what our plans are is to uh, plant this, these native flowers and native grasses. Uh, it's going to be a long duration process. This next year, all you'll see there is a, a black fabric barrier because we need to lay a, bear, a fabric down that's going to kill all the vegetation underneath it. And we will also have uh, an orange safety fence going along the length of it along the beach side. That will be like that until fall. In the fall, we'll pull up the black fabric, then we'll place all the native seeding and lay down a geojute and then that will be like that until next spring. In next spring, we hope to have some germination. Uh, that first year, we will keep it no longer than six inches. So our parks department will be out there with the weed whackers just keeping it down because it's gonna take a number of years for the natives to come up. That first year, pretty much all you'll see is weeds. But as long as we keep the weeds knocked down where the sunlight can get down to the ground, those natives will work on developing their, their root system. And, but we won't probably see them until the following year. So like I said, it's gonna be like a three year process to do this. So um, I indulge your patience on this. Uh, I've been in this process on a couple of other projects. The wait is worth it. Um, I've had conversations with Alicia Hoke. Uh, I think she'll concur that the wait is worth it. I've also talked with uh, um, I forget his name, the guy out at Baker, Baker from uh, Pioneer Ridge. Um, so they've both given me the input on this and uh, both think it's worth a worthwhile project. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for, for the RFP number five. Okay. Any questions? This is a public hearing. Let's do that first. Is there anyone that wants to address the council? I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Thank you. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 254, 2017, approving the plans, specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost for the beach renovations phase three project 2018. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 254, 2017. Is there a motion? Move the recommendation as presented. Second. Thank you. Okay. Skip, I know you have a question. <laughs> uh, the original sign at the beach was donated by ISU, which is now Alliant Energy, when the beach was built. Has anybody contacted them to see if they'd be interested in maybe updating that sign? And this may be a question for Gene, I don't know. Yeah, I think the city administrator has talked to uh, one of the <clears throat> executives at Lion Energy about participating in the new sign. 
and I think they've declined to participate. Um, we have received a grant for $25,000 from La Wapalo County Foundation to pay for $25,000 worth of the new sign. So that'll help defray the cost. Okay, but thank you. We'll be sure to notify Alliant Energy about the new electronic sign since they did provide that <laughs> sign originally and it served us for 25 years. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Your Honor, I just got a quick question. Uh, just out of curiosity, that's nice to hear about the grant from Wapalo County Foundation. That's that's amazing. What kind of, how big is, of an electric sign are we talking about? I have no idea what they cost, how big they should be. What do we get for an RFP for 100000 You're, you're talking about the physical size of the sign? Yeah. What are the physical characteristics of the sign? Like, is it digital? Is it big? Is it, you know, what does it do? Well, it, it will be all, all digital. If you can envision what the, what the uh, Bridgeview Center sign is, it'll be very similar in size to that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one other thought, Mayor. Okay. Councilman Myers? Yeah. Uh, well, do I, I would hope, um, since that sign really, in reference to the beach, uh, would be a three-month need i would hope that we could take a look at is would it also be possible to coordinate it with the one in central park or bridgeview or, or so that it could be used year round the uh gene and i had talked about this the plan is for the sign to be used year round okay thank you any other questions or comments okay let's take the roll Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. This is the time, place, and date set for a public hearing on the status of funded activities for the Atumma Water Improvements Project. I received no objections on this item. Looks like Brad Grief. I'm back again. Welcome. Uh, good, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is a another one of those procedural hurdles that we got to jump through uh, or jump over. Um, for the uh, CDBG funding. Uh, going to be really boring and read to you uh, just to make sure I get everything in here. So uh, again, this is the status of funded activities uh, public hearing for your uh, 2016 water project. That's the, uh, uh, the North Court uh, project. Um, in 2016, uh, you were awarded this grant from the Iowa Economic Development Authority. Um, for the purposes of uh, making those improvements to your city's water distribution system. The benefit to low to moderate income people is estimated at 51.9% based on the census data uh, provided by IEDA. Uh, but the project benefits everybody in the community uh, regardless of the income. Uh, the city applied for and was awarded $800,000 in CDBG funds. Uh, the city was to match that grant uh, with uh, $855,000 in local funds uh, for a total original estimated cost of $1.625 million. Uh, the primary scope of work uh, for the project was to replace approximately uh, 5,300 linear feet of water main along North Court between Highway 63 and Alta Vista and another 1,200 linear feet of water main along Alta Vista uh, from North Court to West Street. Um, four bids were received for the project and the contract for construction was awarded to the lowest responsible bidder, which was Synergy Contracting out of Bondurant. Uh, the original bid was uh, $1,286,697.20. Uh, uh, to date, um, only two change orders have been uh, presented, one you're going to approve later on tonight. Um, for final quantity, or wait, no, that's the other project. <laughs> uh, to date, no change orders have been presented, uh, but a small change order will come hopefully in the next couple weeks as this project is anticipated to close out. Um, the, the project's taking a little bit longer than expected. Um, so two change orders were approved for your engineering contract on this one. Uh, it's with uh, French Renneker Associates out of Fairfield uh, to provide extra uh, oversight they're on the site uh, full time or more like full time instead of part time like they were originally contracted for. Um, so they have more oversight and monitoring of the work going in. Uh, the contract, uh, the current sum of contracts is uh, $1,464,397.20, which means that your overall project budget is uh, about $191,000 under budget, so that's uh, great news for everybody that's living here. 
Uh, construction began on the project in April of 2017. Uh, substantial completion of the project is estimated to be um, early December. Uh, I talked to the contract or the engineer today and he said uh, they were going to do final walkthroughs sometime this week. So uh, that's a little bit faster than I'd anticipated, but oh well. Uh, as of November's pay application, I haven't gotten December's yet. Uh, the contractor had billed approximately 68% of the contract amount. Uh, and talking with the project engineer today, uh, they only have about um, seating in the punch list items uh, to be completed. Uh, as of October's invoices, uh, French Renneker has billed 67% of its contracts, and we have billed, uh, Area 15 has billed 98% of our contract. Your end date's July 3rd. 31st, 2019, so you're well ahead of schedule, and uh, IEDA is going to look uh, favorably on uh, good performance. So, um, and just to kind of, while we're talking about project cost savings, your sewer project that Larry's going to, uh, I think, talk about a little later uh, is going to end up about 20 grand uh, under budget. So, that's very positive news. Okay, this is a public hearing. If there's anybody who wants to comment, now is the time to hear from you. Seeing none, let's close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 255, 2017, approving change order number two for the 2016 sewer rehab project, phase three to phase five, division three. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 255, 2017. Move the recommendation as presented. Second. Thank you. Go ahead, Larry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this project was awarded an $800,000 community development block grant with a total budget of 1.6 million. Uh, to utilize the full extent of the CDBG grant, additional linear foot uh, of pipe lining was added to the base contract as discussed at the July 18th, 2017 council meeting. Uh, the project consisted of lining the sanitary sewer in the Richmond CSO collection basin, uh, the reduction of inflow infiltration into our sanitary collection system to reduce the frequency of CSO discharges is part of our IDNR compliance schedule. Um, We put together a little, just kind of an overview and a PowerPoint. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to point out, and we have a short video we wanted to show, because this is one of the projects that generated quite a few questions from citizens. Um, I'm sure that most of you probably at some point went by this process and seen where the contractor was set up in the center of the street uh, doing the lining <laughs> process. Uh, one of the things when you convert the number of linear feet that we did, uh, it was slightly over 28,000. That's 5.35 uh, miles that we were able to line. The impact we have not only is the, uh, the reduction of the inflow uh, and infiltration from those joints, but it also reduces a lot of the problems we have on the south side with not only roots, but once we pulled all the stormwater out, that system was built relatively flat, so it would increase the amount of work that we'd have to do with our sewer cleaning uh, uh, crews and they're fairly limited. Uh, that department only has five people full time. So that just kind of outlines what we did. We also installed two or nine new manholes. Uh, we also lined 69 manholes and did th uh, three spot repairs, which were basically where you had settlement and would uh, basically sags that, that capture your solids and plugs your systems. That's just a visual map of everything that we were able to cover with this first uh, lining grant in this area. Would you kick that little video on? We did a, just a slightly over a two minute video, uh, just kind of show you the process. And again, it, for those that's uh, viewing from home, we kind of wanted to show how that worked. I don't know how many of the council uh, was able to get out and see that. Okay. This is where they go through and they actually clean uh, the pipe first before they inspect. And that's where they have to get the debris out prior to uh, inserting the liner. You do not want your uh, debris material between the liner and the pipe. You also inspect to make sure that you don't have any structural needs to repair prior to uh, inserting your liner. Exciting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
This is a tap cutter. So when you have protruding taps, that particular one is clay. They basically have to be able to get their camera and their equipment through. So you try to, re uh, to reduce them to where they're about an inch uh, in length or projection into the, into the existing system. Now this process, uh, the liner itself, uh, they bring from their facility in a refrigerated truck. It's already uh, impregnated with the resin. It's actually inside out. And what it's doing now is going in almost like turning the sock inside out and they blow it through the system. And now it's unraveling inside of the existing pipe. So they cut them to approximate length. That's why you don't look at that manhole when it's coming through. <laughs> But that, I was, we just thought that was kind of neat. We've had a lot of questions. And then it goes through kind of the process of preheating. You bring it up to a lower temperature of 120 and you because it's, it's thermal set resin. And then once you get it to that temperature, then you bring it on up to 40 and you cook it depending on its size and its length, the time, time changes. And then you have a cool down period. This process is where they go in any tap that you covered because that's one of the initial things you do after you clean clean is to figure out which taps are active, which are abandoned, uh, which were never used. So that's just how they cut the liner away from your tap. That's all done, you know, remote camera systems, remote uh, robots, basically. And that's what the finished uh, product looks like. And then again, that's looking up. There is a second process that we didn't do that's very expensive, which is called a top hat that goes up your liner. And it actually goes in and uh, it, it's injected up the lateral about four feet. And that was pretty much the video. Okay. Change order one uh, decreased the original contract amount. Uh, from one million three hundred and forty thirteen dollars and forty five cents to a one million three hundred and thirty one thirteen that's what we brought to that earlier council meeting uh, the second change order is where we wanted to utilize the full grant so we added two hundred and twenty nine thousand seven hundred twelve dollars and fifty four cents of additional length into the lines with a new contract sum of one million five hundred and fifty nine thousand eight hundred and twenty five dollars and ninety nine cents Okay. Uh, any questions for Larry? You're not going to comment? Nice job on the video. I think it's always nice when you do that. You've done several of them now, and it gives the public a chance to see what, what we're doing and what you're doing and the company is doing when they're out there with the streets. I appreciate uh, look it. At, like I said, this one generated a lot of interest with the steam shooting up. Everybody was kind of curious. Right. A lot of drive-by spectators. You'd see them come by multiple times. <laughs> Thank you for that. Hearing none, take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yeah. Councilmember yes. Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 257, 2017, approving change order number two for the beach renovations phase two, contract C, boiler HVAC equipment repairs project. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 257, 2017. Is there a motion? Move the, the recommendation. Second. Thank you. Gene, go ahead. The City Council approved the contract in the amount of $92,895 to Maher Plumbing and Heating of Ottumwa through resolution number 179-2017 on August 15th, 2017 for contract C boiler HVAC equipment repairs for the beach renovations phase two project and approved change order number one in the amount of $848 for additional thermostats on October 3rd, 2017. Change order number two consists of adding repairs to the piping manifold located in the pit between the wave and kiddie pools discovered during diagnostic tests on the various piping systems. The additional work was quoted by Maher for $3,550. ACO Unlimited, another contractor on site, working on site quoted $4,922.70 to perform the same work. <clears throat> the completion date remains May 18th, 2018. Uh, you can see the contract C summary. Uh, the phase two project summary to date is as follows. Concrete repairs, $360,315. Uh, pool filter equipment replacement, $133,016.25. Uh, 
Revised contract C boiler HVAC equipment repairs, $97,293. <clears throat> contract D recording indoor pools, $83,701. And revised contractual amounts, $674,325.25. Any questions for Gene? Of course, I've got a question. Thank you, Your Honor. Gene, I don't know if you know this or Dwight May or somebody else, uh, with all these repairs being completed in the phases and going through all this, I know we built a lot of contingency into the project because we knew there would be things that we didn't know about. I was just wondering on an overall project, are we staying relatively close to what we budgeted? Are we under or are we uh, over? It, it looks like to me we're slightly under. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments? Take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. <coughs> Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Resolution number 260, 2017, approving the annual budget of the Ottawa Waterworks Board of Trustees for calendar year 2018. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 260, 2017. Is there a motion? Who the recommendation is presented. Second. Good evening, Bob. Good evening, Good evening Thank you. Uh, the adoption of this budget is required by state code according to section 384.2 of the Code of Iowa and will be forwarded along with the approving resolution to the county auditor if approved. Tim Albert from the Waterworks uh, is here tonight to answer any questions you might have. Uh, Good evening, Tim. Good evening. Any questions for Tim about the budget? Do you want to make some opening comments? Uh, water revenue is projected to increase uh, by 145,436 or about 2%. Um, we have a blended rate increase that will go into effect January 1st of 2018. Uh, small users will see less than a 2% increase, uh, while larger users will see a, a bit larger. Um, the average family that uses five units of water, their monthly bill for water will increase by 47 cents per month. Um, our operating expenses are expected to decrease by about 3.9% um, due to some cost savings through some health insurance and uh, some other things. So our tank maintenance, we had several aggressive years of bringing our tanks back into good service and some of those bigger dollar amounts are starting to drop off. Um, capital projects seem to dominate our budget this next year. Uh, water main replacements total almost 2.5 million and include approximately 12 and a half miles of new water main. Several projects will be coordinated with the city of Ottumwa, including South Davis, South Sheridan, and the East Main project. Another large section that we're uh, looking at is uh, on North Court again, except uh, moving south from Alta Vista down to Park Avenue. Um, any questions, any comments? Uh, Skip is our council representative to the Waterworks and attends those meetings faithfully. Mark? Quick question. Um, what's the what's the average direct payroll increase for next year? Uh, it's going to be 2.5%. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Thank you, Tim. And we also appreciate the good uh, cooperation and sharing back and forth so we can maximize those projects. Okay. Resolution number 261, 2017, approving change order number three and pay request number three for the 2015 catch basin replacement program and rescinding resolution number 241, 2017. Recommendation, pass and adopt resolution number 261, 2017. Move the recommendation as presented. Thank you. Second. Go ahead, Larry. The city accepted this work as final and complete on November 7th, 2017. At the time of the final acceptance, the contractor was 22 months past the contractual due date for submitting documentation for extra work. Um, state law allows a contractor 30 days to file claims after final acceptance of the project. Uh, the contractor has submitted cost documentation for the material incorporated into the work. Uh, the documentation was received and approved by the engineer. Change order three includes the material changes mentioned above. Uh, receipts were received for all the material and the inspector logged all uh, the material in his notes. No additional claims are expected for this contract. Uh, the new contract total 
uh, will be $46,734.81. Uh, the budgeted amount was $50,000. Okay. Any questions for Larry? Okay, take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Ordinance number 3135, 2017, amending Chapter 25, Public Offenses of the Municipal Code of the City of Ottumwa, Iowa, by repealing Section 25110, formerly Section 2564, and enacting a substitute in lieu thereof, allowing the usage of fireworks within the city limits. Recommendation A, pass the first consideration of Ordinance number 3135, 2017. Move the recommendation as presented. Second. Thank you. Chief Miller, you have the floor. Okay, we, uh, we uh, the, the mayor formed and the city formed a, a, a fireworks committee on what went right, what went wrong, and what we need to change. Our first meeting was on, uh, on uh, August 30th, and we had 11 people on the committee, five of the committee members being here tonight. So we had a lot of good discussions about uh, what needs to be done, and uh, basically we come out where there's a resolution that we needed the, the the committee agreed on to take this to council. What are, what our recommendation is for the uh, for the change? Uh, on October 11th, we had a second meeting. On September 8th, we had a meeting at the state. I attended the meeting uh, about where the state's going to go with the, the fireworks bill in 2018. After that meeting, we had a meeting on October 11th, and I discussed with the committee exactly what was discussed, where I thought the committee was going to go to it. Uh, there's supposed to be a second meeting with the legislators on this Friday. Uh, Barb Ed Edmondson is an attorney with the state, and she is writing up all the notes and of the minutes we had on the other the meeting with the state. She didn't get it done in time. The meeting we was having on Friday got postponed until next Friday. So after next Friday, I'll have a better understanding exactly where the state's going to go. But the uh, the recommendation of the committee was to have a slight change. The summer months are going to leave as is because we're going to wait and see what the legislator does if they're going to change anything. The, the winter months, the discussion recommendation of the city council is uh, the original uh, ordinance was on December 31st from 4 o'clock to 10 o'clock. You'd be allowed to shoot fireworks. Selling fireworks is, is a dead issue. There's nothing you can do about that. There's nothing anybody can do about that. So the recommendation from the committee was to, on December 29th and 30th, be allowed to use fireworks from 4 o'clock to 10 o'clock, and on December 31st, be allowed to use fireworks from 4 o'clock till 1 o'clock in the morning. Okay, before we get council comments, we do have uh, Trudy Kavanagh that wanted to address the council. So Trudy, please step up. Trudy Kavanagh, 2851 Oak Meadow Drive. I was on the committee and I just wanted to say, uh, we had a lot of discussion, both for it and against. And I think we came to a good agreement on, on this particular change in the resolution. And, um, I just would like to have you support uh, this change. And, and again, as, uh, as the chief said, it is, is kind of a moving thing until the state gets it all settled down and so on and so forth. So thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for serving on the committee. Thank you. Okay, council, I have some comments. Mark, and Mark. And we'll go down. The <laughs> so um, I have a couple of concerns about this. Uh, number one, you know, uh, right before the council meeting, we spoke with uh, uh, the administrative assistant, Katie King, and her number two, her number two call volume issue this year was the fireworks. And um, most of those people wanted to see a more compressed time schedule than than what we had for the Fourth of July, and I can only assume that they would feel the same way about uh, New Year's Eve as what they do about the Fourth of July. So that I guess that's my first concern, and my second concern is uh, moving too quickly on an ordinance and then having the state come back and possibly change that so everything we did was for naught. Uh, so those are, those are my two concerns. And I, I guess with that being said, I would, I would move that we uh, postpone this, this motion indefinitely. 
Can, can I address your question? Absolutely. The, the first question about uh, uh, having two more days and uh, what the bill says, there was a lot of discussion in the committee about that exact same thing. And it was decided, most of the members decided, were, had made comments that it's going to be really, really cold out and who's going to shoot fireworks in the wintertime. We had a lot of them comments. The comments re regarding what Katie had received, I've, I have never, ever heard that. That's the first time I've heard this tonight. So, uh, and on we when they on next Friday when we do this have this meeting, we'll, I'll have a really good understanding of where they're going to go with this in 2018. I think if they did make changes in the law, they're going to do it early in the session. If they make changes, going back and remember Senator Chapman, who wrote the bill, who co-wrote the bill, said there's not going to be any changes in the law. I, I have some real doubts if that's going to happen. I think they might might maybe change in some things. If I may, Mayor, and I understand he's got a motion, but I, I think it's relevant. I served on that committee also, and I think Trudy and, and Chief Miller both. One of the components that came out of it, and as Trudy spoke, there were people just as many for as there were against. But, but one thing I think, Tony, we're leaving out of this is why the extended days was the committee, and even those against it, felt like, we went back to the issue of enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the persons that was adamantly against fireworks said, you know, one of the problems that may have happened in the summer was we didn't, uh, we didn't indicate quick enough a timeline. And so th that's why the recommendation came for four in the, af or four in the afternoon till 10 in the evening, but, but clearly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief or, or Trudy, but the thing was back to enforcement. You can say well, we're going to delay it and we're just not going to act, but the fact of the matter is the state has made its le stated it's legal, and so it's going to go on. And their their point was, okay, by restricting those times, would people be more cooperative? And then the second issue, Mark, uh, there is nothing, Tony legislatively that is going to be changed a week from Friday. The no. law was passed legislatively. There are a lot of county uh, st cities that are banning it. That's fine. That's what they voted to do. But nothing is going to change a week from Friday as far as the legislative law. This week from Friday is going to be an update of what was discussed on that sh sh shareholders meeting is what's going to happen. Uh, go, going back to the, the enforcement, the, the meeting I went to at the state, that was, that was probably the number one issue in you know, that meeting. That meeting lasted a couple of hours, and that was probably the number one, is if they're not going to enforce it, then it's not going to matter. And it's the same problem. Tumba has the same problem all over the state. It's the enforcement of it. And uh, very few cities are going out and writing citations. In fact, of all the people up there, at this meeting they had, uh, they had uh, city attorneys, they had county attorneys. Uh, police chief, fire chiefs, they had the lobbyists for the fireworks. They had about anything you can imagine deal with fireworks was there. And that was probably the number one issue was enforcement. And it's a problem statewide and nobody's enforcing it. Victor. <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate the committee getting together and, and there's probably a, kind of a split from what it sounds like and just having a conversation about it. But uh, a couple of things, who will let them off in cold weather is a rhetorical question. And uh, from my understanding, and Bob's right, it's, it's legal per the state to sell them, but it's up to us to determine when they're let off in our city. And uh, I was opposed to a longer period of time during the summer to let them off before the 4th of July, and uh, am vehemently opposed to additional days around the new year because additional days leading up to the new year means that people will start letting them off about a week before the 28th and the 29th, and you'll hear them for 10 or 11 days. So uh, on a trial and error basis, I think that we heard more cautionary tales from our citizens after the 4th of July, and it puts stress on an already understaffed police force, and it could put stress on you guys, Chief. And I think that uh, having the one day that we had planned on seems like uh, a safer, more level-headed recommendation rather than to add days after what we witnessed this July. Well, here's part of the situation. You've had between 10 and 15 cities in the state right now has banned the use of fireworks for next year, completely banned it. Senator Chapman was very clear in that meeting we had with the state that that's not the locals or the cities or the county's decision to make. To make. 
the intent of the law was anything with fireworks will go through the state fire marshal's office. Now, the Friday, that meeting we had was on a Friday. On Monday, I had a conversation with the state fire marshal. His first day on the job was Thursday. He was appointed on Thursday. Friday, he started, and this was his first meeting, was this, this discussion. So his opinion was, no, that's not exactly what the intent of the law was. The intent of the law was cities and counties are going to have the option of, of restricting stuff. So when we have this meeting next Friday, I think this is going to be a big discussion. And whatever comes out of this is what they're going to take the legislation begin. And I think this will be addressed early in the session. I just, Go ahead. More or less. So, so really, you got one side wanting cities to be able to make restrictions to it and you got another side saying that it should go through this committee it's the same old stuff so we so if we pass something we may or may not be getting ahead of what ultimately will be the end result is that kind of what you're saying i can't predict what's going to happen with the legislation. well yeah i can't either uh, i'm just um, saying what, what you know what the, the intent of it was this was, and i if i made the comment last when i addressed the council about this last time is is this may change in 2018 because i don't know what the state's going to do I, I don't know i don't really don't know so we're basing this on right now uh, what's going on in the winter months over the over the holiday. Well, I think the council made a statement, you know, back when we started discussing all this, that we weren't going to try to, you know, totally ban fireworks in the Siva Tum. It makes no absolute sense when the state allows the sale of them that you can't use them here. I think we were all unanimous on that. Um, however, you know, people that want to use fireworks have got that privilege to use fireworks. But what we haven't taken into account, I don't believe yet, is the other half of the public who doesn't like fireworks and doesn't want them at all. And so I think a good compromise in between would be two responsible time periods to allow people to shoot off fireworks if we're going to be, you know, given the opportunity to make that decision. And somehow it seems like when things don't go the way the state likes them to, then they just kind of yank that home authority back. And so we step out there with these laws and then they say, well, no, really, you can't pass those anyway. So I think, like Councilmember Rose said, maybe we're better off. Uh, just waiting to see what the state does. They are the authority. Uh, they have authority over local cities. And so, um, you know, giving it another, you know, six, eight months with the ordinance we have, uh, I, I guess, is 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 okay. I think it's still too liberal uh, with the time period in the summertime. I would agree with Council Member Streeby. Uh, we're not taking into account the other half of the citizens who do have a say in this process. And while I think everybody can have an opportunity to shoot off fireworks, and have their fun for both times, then we still need to be respectful of the people that don't. And I don't think we're doing that um, with rushing into another ordinance or expanding the current one. I think a compromise in the middle would be fine. I do think we need to restrict the summertime, but I would I would go with Councilman Barrow to just hold off on this. And Well, we have a motion it. from Councilman Rowe, but I don't recall a second. So are I'll you- second that motion. Part of the discussion with the committee was to, to, was to meet in the middle on this to ha allow a few more days. That was part of the, uh, part of the discussion. Of over and above what they got now, mm -hmm. add more days to it. Right, because you're gonna go from one day to three days. And that was a compromise just, right. just right. for the window, just for the, you know, fourth or uh, December 31st day. Right, and I don't really, you know, the, the time period in the winter time to me, just personally doesn't, doesn't have as much impact as the length of time in the summertime. Uh, I think we can all get what we want and all be able to use fireworks when we want to use them. But I think it's still a little excessive yet on the summertime. The wintertime, not so much. I'm okay with that one. But I still think we better wait and come up with something a little better. Has everybody had a chance to give their say? And you want to repeat the motion, Amanda, so we're clear on what we're voting on? The motion is to postpone Ordinance 3135 indefinitely. You ready to vote? Okay, take the roll. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? No. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, thank you very much. Good discussion. At this point, uh, are there any individuals that want to address the council on any issue that's not on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, I want to remind council that uh, we have the Mercy Clinic open house, and um, I think considering that was an $18 million investment in our community, I hope that several of you will be in attendance uh, on the 6th, and I think it's 5 o'clock for the ribbon cutting. Uh, I'd also make a comment that um, 
There is some movement on the St. Joe Hospital project. I'm not at a point where I can make any more comments than that, but uh, we are pursuing uh, getting the hospital and uh, the private developer together to work on that and uh, come to some resolution and hopefully uh, either the next meeting or the first part of January we'll have some uh, information we can share. That's again, the hospital owns the building, the private developer is a private firm. We have no business telling either of them what to do, uh, but they have been sharing information with us uh, openly. So, Any other comments or questions for the good of the council? Okay, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Councilmember Streeby? Yes. Councilmember Dalby? Yes. Councilmember Myers? Yes. Councilmember Rowe? Yes. Thank you all and good night.